Okay, I had to click a few buttons there to get going. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to today's presentation. Darren came to my attention as a reference from the national president of the uh, National Farmers Union, who's a local farmer here in the Ottawa Valley. And she said, uh, oh, I think Darren's the one that's gonna do the best job for you. So it's interesting that Darren's background includes many years of farming in Saskatchewan, raising grains, oil seeds, pulse crops, and other specialty crops. Darren is still living in Saskatchewan and is currently the Director of Climate Crisis Policy and Action for Canada's National Farmers Union. He has academic degrees in history, biology, and political studies. Darren's research, writing, and educational pursuits over the past 20 years have focused on how humans have turned nature, energy sources, and technologies into cities, food supplies, manufacturing systems, and cultures. Today's presentation, Climate, Farms, Food, Emissions, and Solutions, highlights his understanding of why farm and food systems, like all systems, are increasingly sources of greenhouse gases with unintended damaging environmental consequences. Darren is the author of the 2019 report, Tackling the Farm Crisis and the Climate Crisis, the 2019 book, Civilization Critical, Energy, Food, Nature, and the Future, and the 2021 report, Imagine If, a vision of a narrow, of a near zero emission farm and food system for Canada. So with that background, uh, Darren, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you and I'm gonna be a keen listener. Thank you very much for that introduction, Phil. Uh, I trust I'm coming in clearly. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I'm aware of the, the past speakers list for the uh, Canadian Association for the Club of Rome. And I'm, I'm really honored to be uh, added to that august list. And, and thanks for everybody that tuned in here today and who might uh, watch this on video. I'm just, there we go. Uh, in the, in the work up to this presentation, I changed the uh, title and the focus a little bit. Um, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, material flows and civilizations, and the true meaning of sustainability. And I realized the last part of that is going to be a little provocative for a, a group of people that know as much as, as you do. But uh, what I want to do in this talk is I want to begin with the very concrete and recent, uh, give you a, a view of the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming out of the current Canadian farming system. So I'm gonna show you all the greenhouse gases coming out of agriculture, out of the production of farm inputs and the soil atmosphere exchanges of carbon and carbon dioxide, often called sequestration. After I do that, I'm gonna to move to a bigger picture, longer term look, kind of stretch out over 10,000 years of farm and food systems. And then I'm gonna expand yet again to look at the larger civilization and the way we move materials through that civilization, kind of the geometry, the time space geometry of our civilization and um, how that creates a myriad of environmental problems. So I, I'm gonna tell a story rooted in agriculture, but the, the story I tell about the creation of linear systems in agriculture uh, I'm then going to expand on, and, and we can see that that same story is played out throughout our whole economy and civilization. So there's five parts to my presentation. Uh, the first one is on agricultural emissions. So this is a graph that comes from a report that we just released last week. It is the most detailed and fine-grained look at agricultural emissions so far assembled took us months to put this together. <clears throat> Most of the categories are based on agriculture and agri-food Canada and uh, environment and climate change Canada data. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I'll just, it, well, and you can get this uh, report, it's what 32 pages at nfu.ca. So I'll just show you some of the highlights uh, that are visible in this graph. Uh, 
Um, there's 39 categories of emissions from agriculture and the production of agricultural inputs, and also soil atmosphere exchanges, uh, otherwise known as sequestration, those dotted lines at the bottom. And I won't go into that detail, but just to point out, there's three major categories of emissions visible here. At the top, we've got the red bands, uh, mostly farm fuel use and uh, some emissions from electricity production. Then in the middle, we've got nitrogen fertilizer related emissions. So the emissions when farmers use nitrogen in their fields and when the factories produce nitrogen and also a bit from the upstream natural gas supply. And then at the bottom, we've got a, a, a large chunk of emissions related to cattle, uh, enteric emissions, methane out of their mouths and also manure. The data covers the period 1990 to 2019. We'll be adding 2020 data soon, it'll be out soon. And the units, though the units don't much matter, but uh, if you're wondering, they are in millions of tons of greenhouse gas equivalent. So we've converted all the, well, Environment and Climate Change Canada has converted all the methane and nitrous oxide, et cetera, to CO2e. So just to, to give you the highlight reel here, uh, some things are obvious, but are you know nonetheless worth making explicit. Emissions are going up. So the top line on the graph rises from about 66 million tons in 1990 to about 84 million tons in 2019. The second thing I'll note is that the main driver of that increase is increasing emissions from nitrogen fertilizer. That's those green bands in the middle. Those green bands get wider and wider. That's the main driver for the, the top line going up. The top line isn't going up because farmers are using a lot more fuel. It's not going up because uh, cattle are producing a lot more emissions. It's largely going up because of the increase in nitrogen fertilizer production and use. And I'm gonna talk a lot about nitrogen in this, uh, in this talk. Uh, the third thing I'll say is that uh, cattle are a big chunk of this. Those blue bands at the bottom are emissions from cattle, both uh, the, the methane that comes out of their mouth when they digest grass and forage, and also the methane and nitrous oxide that comes from their manure. There's a lot that can be said about cattle, pro and con. Uh, what I find in working to interpret cattle emissions for years is that every time I think I've kind of figured out what to say about this, uh, I get it. Someone offers me a deeper understanding. Suffice to say that the, the common sort of simplistic ideas that sort of cattle are a climate catastrophe or cattle can sequester enough carbon to save us all. Both of those extreme and, and simplified views are, are of course incorrect. And there's, a, there's kind of a large nuanced space in the middle that takes into account the fact that, you know, grassland ecosystems and herbivores have co-evolved and that, uh, you know, the earth has always hosted a lot of methane producing ruminant animals just as they do today. So uh, I think there's a lot of room for, for nuance when we're talking about those cattle emission. And the final thing I'll draw your attention to on this graph is those dotted lines at the bottom, those aren't emissions, those are exchanges of carbon and carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the soil. So whereas emissions tend to be from combustion and from industrial processes in many cases, and you know, in the case of CO2, they tend to be fairly permanent and non-reversible. Uh, CO2 remains in the atmosphere for centuries and, and a significant portion for millennia. Uh, those soil atmosphere exchanges at the bottom are much more temporary, much more reversible. So there's a number of them down there. You've, maybe if you've followed the agricultural uh, discussions, you've heard about soil carbon sequestration from reduced tillage. That's one of the dotted lines. But I'll just draw your attention to that gray dotted line at the bottom. That's really the, the total, the net sequestration. Uh, you can see in the 1990s, it was, a it was an outflow from soil to the atmosphere. So the way farmers were farming was actually depleting soil carbon, and that was ending up as CO2. And then that changed as the 90s went on and through the 2000s kind of plateaued. And since 2010, that line has been inflecting upward. What that means is the rate of soil carbon sequestration is decreasing, a decreasing rate in terms of millions of tons per year. But I think what's 
most important to take away from that line is where it is today and kind of where the, that is relative to agricultural emissions and emissions from the larger economy. So right now, all things considered, the way farmers farm on about 150 million acres of Canadian land sequesters about 6 million tons of CO2 into soil carbon every year, 6 million tons. And some things aren't counted. Uh, grasslands aren't counted, wetlands destruction, but leaving that aside for a minute, it, it's, it's approximately useful to say that there's about 6 million tons of soil carbon sequestration per year. That compares to 84 million tons of agricultural emissions and 720 million tons of emissions overall in the economy. So this amount of agricultural soil carbon sequestration equals about 7% of agricultural emissions and about 1% of emissions as a whole. So I guess what I'd say there is that the, the scope is fairly limited, you know, relative to the size of the emissions, uh, these sequestration numbers are not very large. I mentioned that the main driver for increasing emissions is the increase in the use of nitrogen fertilizer. This is a graph of about 50 years of Canadian nitrogen fertilizer use, 1968 to 2020. And you can see the, the strong upward trend line Farmers have doubled their use of nitrogen since 1993, quadrupled it since the 1970s. And uh, many of you will be familiar with, you know, other material flows through petro-industrial capitalist economies and, and that doubling and redoubling is something we see over and over again. But uh, ju just to point out that the real driver here in Canada uh, for the increasing emissions is nitrogen fertilizer production and use. Just to say a few more things about nitrogen, Nitrogen is a fossil fuel product. The main input is natural gas. If you were to go to a big nitrogen fertilizer factory, and I'll show you a picture of one here in a moment, you would essentially see a big uh, natural gas pipe going in one side and a nitrogen fertilizer gas pipe coming out the other side. The, the, the gas version of nitrogen fertilizer is in hydrous ammonia NH3. Uh, so really, we're turning uh, fossil fuel calories into fertilizer so that we can have more food calories and, and feed more people. Uh, the process is so energy intensive that by the time you get a ton of nitrogen fertilizer into the field, a ton of actual N into the field, you've consumed the energy equivalent of two tons of gasoline. So a, a large energy input into that system. And that's one of the reasons you get such a large emissions footprint. And nitrogen fertilizer is almost unique. Well, it is unique among all human processes and products in that it manages to make itself uh, a major uh, source of all three of the main greenhouse gases. Methane in its upstream natural gas supply carbon dioxide in its production from fertilizer factories, and then nitrous oxide downstream in its use on farms. And, and these emissions are large. This is a picture of the Koch brothers fertilizer plant in Brandon, Manitoba. Uh, yes, those Koch brothers. And uh, this is the largest single emission source in the entire province of Manitoba. So these fertilizer plants are large sources of emissions. So just to, to get back to that graph again, you can see uh, nitrogen fertilizer production and use uh, just about doubles from 12 to 22 million tons. And the top line is going up from uh, 66 up to 84 million tons over a 29 year period. So that graph includes a lot of categories a lot of detail and in order to make it legible we simplify that down to three large groupings uh, fossil fuel emissions from fossil fuels and energy use emissions from nitrogen fertilizer and uh, emissions from cattle but we can simplify more and, and drill down a little deeper and and come to a more foundational understanding of agricultural emissions and and to do that we can ask the question why are there agricultural emissions at all and, and I would answer the question of why there are agricultural emissions at all this way. Because 
agriculture has been made into a linear system. And a key part of my talk is this idea of linear versus circular flows of material. We've made agriculture into a linear system and we're now pushing inputs into one end of those linear systems and emissions are coming out the other end. And key is this, the tonnage of greenhouse gases coming out of agriculture, that's a direct function of the tonnage of inputs going in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, a provocative idea and just stay with me on this. I, I hope to convince you that, you know, it's worth considering this provocative idea. And that's this, that agriculture doesn't produce greenhouse gas emissions. That it's agricultural inputs that produce greenhouse gas emissions. And I would suggest that we know that 100% for sure, without a doubt, because we have 10,000 years of data. So for 10,000 years, humans have farmed and we haven't affected the atmosphere or the climate until recently. Then uh, about a hundred years ago, we started using a lot of inputs, a lot of fuels, a lot of fertilizer, and suddenly agriculture became a very high emission production system. So for, for 10,000 years, and I, I know it's slightly longer, 12,000 and it's being backdated all the time, but for sort of ease of reference, we'll call it 10,000 years, farmers farmed and they didn't affect the climate or the atmosphere. Until recently when we started pushing more and more inputs into the system, and as we did so, the emissions went up. And I think it then follows very inescapably that if we want a low emission food system, it's going to have to be a low input food system. Tweaking around the edges can help a little bit, but really if the emissions are a function of the inputs and we want fewer emissions, we need to push in fewer inputs. So I just wanna walk through some of the changes that have happened in agriculture, uh, just to give you a sense of this transition from circular to linear flows in agriculture, because that transition from circular to linear flows is really a defining aspect of our civilization as a whole. And, and by exploring it sort of in microcosm in agriculture, we can come to understand it better in the larger civilization. So, this is where I'm zooming in from today. Uh, it looked like that until uh, about 10 days ago, the snow is starting to melt here now, thankfully. But this is the, the farm uh, that my family bought in 1959, where I grew up and where I still live. And I'm showing it to you because that barn and those solar panels symbolize a, a couple of things. So that barn was completed in 1918. Uh, that was bad timing for a couple of reasons. One, the, the gentleman that had it built died in the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918. So every time I look out my window in the morning when I'm making my morning coffee, I'm reminded of what can happen in pandemics. But also 1918, as the next graph will show, was the year that, that horses really gave way to tractors. And, and the barn was built to, to house draft horses. It wasn't built for beef cattle. It wasn't built for dairy cattle. That barn was built to house draft horses and that barn and those horses were to be the pulling power center of a very large and prosperous farm. But that, that plan was derailed by several factors, including the coming of tractors and, and the Spanish flu. So <clears throat> what's, what's the, the symbolic importance of that barn? I would suggest that that draft horse barn it symbolizes the, the final days of nearly 10,000 years of solar powered, low input, low emission agriculture. You know, up until 1918, when that barn was built, there really were no inputs into agriculture. There was no fossil fuels going in, no fertilizer going in, no chemicals, no seed, uh, a bit of steel, but not even much of that. And some of that was recycled. So that barn, represents the end of a very, very long era of human agriculture, wherein it was solar powered, low input and low emission. And those solar panels symbolize perhaps, if not the beginning of a new era of solar powered, low emission or low input, low emission agriculture, at least the potential 
for that solar powered low input low emission agriculture so in a way those that barn and those solar panels which were built exactly 100 years later kind of form some bookends to a, a period in agriculture so what i'm going to talk about next is just this transition from circular to linear flows in agriculture as many of you'll know the biosphere moves everything in a circle we have billions of years of circular flows in the biosphere cycles the nitrogen cycle the phosphorus cycle the potassium cycle the sulfur cycle uh, hydrogen and oxygen cycle in, in the form of water the water cycle nature moves its materials in circles they're circular flows, they're loops, they're recycling flows. It does that because if it didn't, it would quickly run out of material. It would, it would deplete and draw down. So the, 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 the real pattern of material flows for billions of years were these circular flows. And human systems, including agriculture, because they emerged out of those natural systems and were dependent on those natural systems and to a very real extent still are, they embodied those circular flows. So the, the flows in agriculture for most of the last 10,000 years were circular. Circular flows of fertility, circular exchanges of energy. The farm produced the energy to run the farm. The horses worked to grow the, the grain, to power the horses to work to grow the grain. These circular flows and exchanges, um, seeds, of course. And I'll just, I'll just walk through that. But before I do, I just wanna point out the, the breach that occurred at the beginning of the, the 20th century. And what happened in agriculture in, at the beginning of the 20th century, and it's very visible, so that's why I chose agriculture to illustrate it, is after millennia in agriculture and after billions of years in nature, human did some, humans did something that had never been done before. And in agriculture, we, we took those circular flows, those loops of nature, we cracked them open, we stretched them out, we made them linear and we found ways to jam ever larger quantities of material into one end and out the other end came ever larger quantities of food, but also of greenhouse gas emissions and toxicity and, and species extinction and unintended consequences and a whole bunch of other things. But the key change that I'm about to walk through is loop after loop is broken, open, stretched out, made linear. And, and largely replaced with a linear flow where before the flow was circular. So in chronological order, the first loop in agriculture to be broken was that of the energy exchange. Uh, before 1918 and the coming of the tractor, the source of energy for the farm was the farm field. After 1918 and through the 20s, 30s, 40s, et cetera, the source wasn't the farm field, it was the oil field. So whereas before the, the fields would produce the grain and the, and the hay and the grass to run the horses that worked that farm, after that, the, it would be the oil field producing petroleum. It would move through the, the farm, through the tractor, through the exhaust pipe, out of the exhaust pipe and into the atmosphere. And, and this just shows how that unfolded in the 20th century. There were a few tractors before 1918, but they were large and largely unaffordable, too big for the farms. But after the First World War, there was a lot of industrial capacity to produce smaller tractors. Farmers picked up these smaller tractors and they really took off as this graph of tractor numbers in Canada shows. Uh, the blue line that goes up is the number of tractors in Canada and the brown line that goes down is the number of horses. So really the the energy source for the farm ceased to be the farm. It, it, it was now uh, distant oil fields. And, and not only are these linear flows in space, you know, from the oil field via pipeline and truck to the farm and through the tractor and out the exhaust pipe into the atmosphere, not only are they linear flows in space, they're linear flows in time. The oil was, was uh, accumulated over hundreds of millions of years. It passes through the farm and it goes out the exhaust pipe and the CO2 stays in the atmosphere uh, for hundreds or thousands of years. So there's this movement through time. We, we've changed the time space geometry of the planet when we move to these linear systems. So the first loop that got cracked open was the, the energy supply 
for the farm. Uh, the next one was fertility. This happened some decades later. For most of the time that humans had practiced agriculture, they found ways to cycle nutrients as much as possible. Uh, they, they had to because they just had no other sources. They, when human population started to rise, they tried to access guano deposits, et cetera. But for most of that 10,000 year period, the fertility that was available on the land had to come from the landscape near to that land. But in the 1960s, fertilizer use started taking off. And instead of the farm supplying its own fertility, fertility would come from a mine, a, a potash mine or a phosphorus mine or a factory that was fed by fossil fuels, a nitrogen factory, and that would be transported to the farm. That fertility would, would stay in the soil for a while, be picked up by the plant. And then often that was taken away so that the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the potassium was then trucked to the city. It would go through a store in the form of food into a household, through the people, uh, out the people, into the, the toilets and the sewers, then into the river. And then the river would act as a conveyor and convey that nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium to deep ocean burial. So they had this long set of linear conveyors with, with mines and factories at one end and fields and food supplies and people in the middle and then sewage plants and rivers and, and deep ocean burial at the other end. So we set up this massive conveyor uh, on the earth to convey the essential nutrients of life uh, in a linear direction. And farmers became more and more uh, dependent on that. Uh, and again, you see this doubling and redoubling. We've doubled nitrogen use in Canada in the last, well, since 1993. We've quadrupled it since 77. We've increased it eightfold since 1970. And I was born a few years before that uh, in the 60s. It's it, fertilizer use is 16 times higher now than when I was born. And uh, the trend continues to go upward. We kept breaking loops. Uh, so if it was the energy loop in the 1920s and fertilizer in the 60s, you fast forward another decade or two, and we're breaking the loops of seed. So in traditional systems, of course, the farm would produce a crop and some of that crop would be taken and put aside for seed and then that would be used in the next year. So the crop would produce the seed and the seed would produce the crop and it went around in a circle and there was no external inputs. Increasingly, however, seed because of patenting, hybrids, intellectual property rights, a whole bunch of other things, privatization of seed development. Increasingly, seed is now something that is a linear flow. The farmer purchases it from a corporation, from a seed lab. It comes into the farm, it's used for a year to grow a crop, and then it goes off the farm with the crop and new seed is brought in again. So we've created this linear flow through the farm of seed year after year. And knowledge the same way. Uh, you can imagine that for most of the last 10,000 years, knowledge moved as a feedback loop. The farmers had some knowledge, they externalized that, onto the landscape in the form of planting and, and animal husbandry decisions. They observed what happened as a result of their decisions and then they internalized uh, the, the key learning from that and modified their plan. So there was this loop, they'd externalized the internal, internalized the external, and there was this feedback loop between the farmers and the agricultural systems, each exchanging information with the other. Uh, of course, now the flow of knowledge is much more linear. There's a huge inflow of knowledge into farms in the form of custom formulated fertilizer, uh, exotic chemistry, herbicides and pesticides, data algorithms and platforms that farmers can't understand, uh, machinery that we can't fix, et cetera, that a, a huge flow of information and technology has, has turned farmers from the main producers of agricultural knowledge into uh, managers and consumers of agricultural knowledge. And just to say a bit about uh, chemicals for a minute, uh, like everything else that's increased too. This is a slide from a presentation. It's one of the few slides I didn't put together myself. This is from a, another presentation. Uh, this shows the percentage increase in insecticide and herbicide use in Canada between 1990 and 2010. 
So between 1990 and 2010 in Canada, insecticide use doubled and herbicide uh, use nearly tripled. So the, the, the use of just about every farm input, plastics, et cetera, is all going up. So I hope what I've done is given a sense of how agriculture illustrates this larger move from circular to linear systems and how that move to linear systems is really the underlying reason that we have greenhouse gas emissions out, out of agriculture. Uh, there's a little bit of a caveat around that, perhaps around uh, cattle and livestock, and, and I can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. But uh, even with that, you know, firmly in view, I, I would still argue that the main reason that we have emissions coming out of agriculture is that we're pushing ever larger quantities of inputs in. So having seen that in agriculture, I now want to generalize this just a little bit more and to look out across our global economy as a whole. So we'll just give you a, a few insights uh, and build upon those. The first insight is this that uh, the material flows through the global economy as a whole in the 19th, 20th and 20th first century uh, were, were linear flows. And as I said before, that's new. Before about 1850, the material flows in nature and in human systems were circular. A second insight, sorry. A second insight I'll offer is this. Atoms are indestructible and many molecules persist. And what that means is everything ends up somewhere. Whatever you push into one end of our linear petroindustrial systems comes out the other end. And some of it comes out in benign forms, uh, but a lot of it comes out in forms that are not so benign, or at least not in the quantities we're producing them. Uh, in the quantities we're pushing them out, even those things that might be benign like carbon dioxide quickly cause a very large environmental problem. So the key on site number two is with these linear systems, everything ends up somewhere. What you push in comes out. So if you put those two together, what it says is if we push billions of tons of indestructible atoms and persistent molecules into one end of our linear systems, they come out the other end. And what that insight allows us to do is it allows us to understand that the the linear flow systems of, of our sort of the linear flow structure of our entire civilization is causing a wide range of problems and that those problems are related they're not isolated they're not independent of each other it, it's not easy to solve one without solving the other almost all of our environmental problems be it pollution or depletion etc are related including climate change ocean dead zones uh, lakes clogged with algae, oceans full of plastic, toxicity, resource depletion, deforestation, etc. Those are all just the outgrowths of the linear systems uh, and linear systems that are trying to push more and more material through all the time. You end up with depletion at one end and pollution and accumulation at the other. So again, atoms are indestructible. I'm going to talk about carbon atoms, nitrogen atoms, phosphorus atoms. Atoms are indestructible. You can change uh, the, the molecules that they're in, but uh, those atoms, if they go into the end of our in petro-industrial linear systems, they'll come out and end up somewhere. So I'll just give you a few examples. Carbon atoms go in in the form of fossil fuels and carbon atoms come out as CO2. And that leads to climate change, ocean acidification, and a host of other effects. And uh, most of you will have seen graphs like this. This is just 800,000 years of ice core and other data showing where CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere have gone over the, the last 800,000 years. Again, everything that goes in comes out. So carbon atoms go in in fossil fuels and, and from other sources and carbon atoms come out as methane, CH4. And that gives you climate change as well. Uh, methane, CH4, is a greenhouse gas 30 times more powerful than, than carbon dioxide when it comes to causing warming. So this is a graph of methane concentrations in Earth's atmosphere compared to the previous one. This is kind of short term. It's only 10,000 years, but you can see that uh, methane concentrations were relatively flat until about 1800. 
And then as a result of oil and gas and coal production, landfills, rice paddy production, and uh, cattle, we've tripled the methane concentrations in our atmosphere uh, and making that a, a primary driver of, of climate change, second only to carbon dioxide. So moving from carbon to nitrogen, nitrogen atoms go in in the form of nitrogen fertilizer and nitrogen atoms come out as nitrous oxide and various nitrogen components. And this leads to climate change, ocean dead zones, terrestrial ecosystem damage. Uh, nit nitrous oxide, I should have mentioned earlier, is uh, one of the three main greenhouse gases and it's about 300 times more powerful than CO2 when it comes to driving warming, the, the number changes from one uh, IPCC report to another, it was 265 at one point, I think it was 298 at another, but uh, 300 is close enough for our purposes, a very powerful greenhouse gas. And I just wanna talk about nitrogen a little more for a moment. Some of you might be familiar with this report, uh, 2009, I believe, Will Steffen and Johan Rockström. And this is a report in which they popularized the idea of a safe operating space for humanity, otherwise known as planetary boundaries. And that graph on the bottom is, it was their way of sort of showing that the green area is the safe operating space for humanity. And those red wedges coming out show by how much we've transgressed that safe operating space, by how much we've pushed past the, the, the planetary limits for Earth. And most people could guess what uh, some of those wedges would be that we've pushed farthest past the safe operating space. And I'll just zoom in. So on the left, you have biodiversity loss. And that's no surprise. Uh, that's also known as extinction. Most of you will know that we're in the fastest extinction event in 65 million years. So that's not a hard one to, to guess. But almost nobody would have guessed the, the second area, that wedge on the right, that place where we've also pushed furthest past the safe operating space for planet Earth, past the planetary boundaries. And that's in the nitrogen cycle. Humans have intervened massively. We've tripled the amount of nitrogen flowing through terrestrial ecosystems compared to pre-industrial times, compared to the creation of the Haber-Bosch nitrogen process at the beginning of the 20th century, we have cranked up the flow of nitrogen through farmland and forests and jungles and wetlands and grasslands. We've cranked it up threefold. There's three times as much nitrogen flowing through those systems on average. And in places where there's a lot of farming, that number isn't three times, it's 10 times. And uh, when you read some of the literature, uh, it's much higher than 10 times. So a, a tremendous human intervention in probably the most important biogeochemical flow on the earth. Uh, you know, it, it, this is a core to the idea of the Anthropocene. If we weren't so focused and, you know, rightly focused, but if we weren't so focused on the climate crisis, we would all be talking about the nitrogen crisis. There is a nitrogen crisis on earth but um, it's just been kind of elbowed out of consciousness by the much larger carbon crisis. Uh, again, this is a, a graph. This is a graph of global nitrogen fertilizer use, not, um, not Canadian. And you can see again, the strong upward trend and the doubling and redoubling. So I'm gonna move from atoms to molecules and uh, just to, just to look at one or two, atoms are indestructible, molecules aren't indestructible, but many molecules persist. You've heard of things like persistent pollutants. Many of the molecules we push into our linear systems come out the other end. So for instance, plastics go in and plastics and microplastic fragments come out and we end up with a situation we have now where the oceans are full of plastic, our wildlife is increasingly full of plastic, as is human food and water. So this is a graph I did of plastic production and consumption for the 100 year period from 1919 to 2019. And you can see that clear, crisp, exponential curve that uh, you see so often when you look at material throughput through human 
uh, economic systems. Uh, tremendous flow through there, through those linear systems, and not surprisingly, uh, because we're pushing hundreds and hundreds, in this case, almost 500 million tons of plastic into one end, it's coming out the other end and lodging in water and land and, and biological systems. So let's just wrap this all up together and look at material use overall. This is a graph of total material use in the global economy. It covers the period 1850 to 2100. So it, it goes back um, about 150 years and then projects forward about 100. It looks a little bit messy because it's it draws together seven different data sets, uh, peer reviewed articles by Kraussman and others, uh, articles, studies rather by the UN and the OECD, et cetera. And it, it does that to kind of give a, a long-term view of where we are with material use overall. And that little red oval gives you a sense of, of where we are today. We're at about 90 billion tons per year and increasing each year. So for ease of figures, let's just call that 100 billion tons per year. 100 billion tons a year over the next decade is a trillion tons. We're planning to push a trillion tons of material into our economy. And I, I, I forgot to tell you um, what we mean by materials here. I'll just let me step back for one second. The, the tonnage in this graph is everything except water, essentially. So it's all the uh, oil, coal, uh, wheat, barley, soybeans, gravel, plastic, diamonds, gold, lead, steel, well, iron, etc. So it's, it's all the materials that are flowing through our economy except for water. And we're at about 90 billion tons right now, call it 100 billion. So we're looking at pushing a trillion tons of material into the linear systems on earth over the next 10 years. And that entire trillion tons is gonna come out the other end and lodge somewhere. Uh, it's gonna end up in our oceans or our landfills or our atmosphere, or as I like to say, in landfills, sea fills or sky fills, because we're using our, our atmosphere and our oceans as a, as a dumping ground as well. So just a, a tremendous amount of, of throughput, a tremendous amount of throughput and it's causing uh, problems in, in a whole range of environmental spaces. So um, just coming to the last few slides, I'm gonna wrap up here in just a, a few minutes. Uh, the fourth part of my talk is a little bit shorter and I'm just gonna say a few things about energy and, and that is energy must be immaterial. And the, the subtitle here is any, or any energy source that has a material carrier will be trouble. And until the 18th century, of course, all energy systems on earth relied on solar power. Uh, there's a bit of a caveat to that in that some coal was being used in the 1600s, but uh, largely if you went to any place on earth in the 1700s, you'd see a world run by water wheels and wind power and and biomass, it was, it was essentially solar powered. And of course we, we've changed that. And this is the result. This is that graph again of 800,000 years of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. But when we think about that deeply, what are we really seeing there? We're seeing the accumulation of the energy carrying atoms. When we dig up oil and natural gas and coal, we're, we're digging up energy, but we're also digging up the energy carriers, the energized carbon and hydrogen atoms. And when we burn that, we, we reap the energy and that goes in one direction. But those energy carriers, that material, the material component of that energy goes in another direction. And what we're seeing there is the accumulation of spent fuel. Because fossil fuels have energy carrying materials, the spent fuel accumulates. We take the energy out and the materials accumulate, the spent fuels accumulate. So be, I, I think this look at materials can, can help us make some decisions about what energy sources we might, might wanna choose in the future. There's energy sources that have material carriers and we're deploying all of those right now, oil, coal, 
natural gas, nuclear, and biomass. And there's energy sources without material carriers. And I would suggest that it's those sources that do not have material carriers that are by far the, the best uh, choices moving forward. Solar, wind, and to a limited extent, hydro. I'm just going to end by, by saying something about sustainability that, that may be provocative. Uh, and that is that the definition of sustainability is very, very clear. And not to keep you in, in suspense, uh, it's not ambiguous. There's just one definition. And it's, it's simple. And it's this. Sustainability equals circular plus solar. The circular flows of materials powered by solar energy. And we know that for sure because that's the pattern that sustained the biosphere for billions of years, uh, that largely sustained a lot of human systems for millennia, although I will acknowledge that there was soil depletion, et cetera, in some of those uh, pre-industrial farming systems. But really, when we reflect upon the, the, the basic structure of, the, of Earth's biosphere, we find that it is simply the circular flow of materials powered by, by solar energy. And that is the way we will create sustainable systems moving forward. Um, just to touch on quickly what sustainability isn't, uh, if, if I was to invite you to picture sustainability, you might close your eyes and picture stability, constancy, horizontal trend lines, you know, things aren't, CO2 isn't building up, it isn't, you know, nothing's depleting, nothing's building up. If you were to picture sustainability in your mind, you would picture horizontal trend lines. But of course, this is the world in which we live. This is the post-1870 takeoff in human economic uh, size, the gross world product from the last uh, 2,000 years, from one CE to current. And to that, we could add the energy use over that same period of time. And we could add the emissions over the same period of time. There's no horizontal trend lines there. That growth in the economy essentially vetoes sustainability. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. I'll just flag a few things that you can uh, access for more information. The NFU has produced three reports over the last uh, two or three years. The one on the left is tackling the farm crisis and the climate crisis. That's probably the, the most inclusive look that's been done in Canada so far on greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and solutions to reducing those gases. It's about 100 pages long. The report in the middle is from last year. Imagine if a vision of a near zero emission farm and food system for Canada. That is a very positive report, a very hopeful, optimistic report that invites readers to situate themselves in 2030 and imagine that we did everything right between 2021 and 2030. Uh, and we created a, a farm and food system that had very low emissions and, and, and much increased sustainability. Uh, that's a very readable, very positive report. And the one on the right just came out last week. That's where that graph that I showed you at the beginning is taken from. And uh, it's the most detailed assessment so far on agricultural emissions and emissions from farm input production and the, the soil atmosphere exchanges. Last thing I'll flag, uh, this is the book I published in 2019. This book really delves into this idea of the transition from billions of years of circular flows to the 20th century creation of linear flows and, and how that really changed the world and created tremendously powerful, tremendously productive human systems, but at the same time created a whole spectrum of problems we're now dealing with in terms of depletion and, and accumulation pollution. So uh, I'll thank you for your time and uh, turn it back to Phil. And I look forward to a great question and answer period. OK, well, thank you very much, Darren. Um, needless to say, there are some really interesting questions and comments coming up. Uh, Peter Volkowski, Raymond Leary, and John Meyer, I have you as the first three that are going to be speaking. Uh, 
And Peter, if uh, you're ready, turn on your uh, video and your mic, and uh, you're going to ask a question about uh, quantifying emissions per unit of produced food. Uh, yeah, I my mic's on. I don't have uh, the camera working, so uh, we're without that. Uh, your your first uh, big graph, Darren, was basically uh, absolute amounts of uh, emissions. Uh, do you have the equivalent graphs showing the emissions per unit of uh, of uh, food produced? I never... Uh no, we don't, Peter. Um, and and I take your point. Uh, there's there's this idea of of emissions intensity, and I think emissions intensity is probably improving. Uh, total emissions are going up, but of course output is going up as well. So the question is, what about tons of CO two per ton of food output? I think we're making a bit of progress on that. Of course, the app. I'd say. A couple of things about that. One, the atmosphere isn't that much interested in our intensity. It, it, it sort of reflects absolute tons. Uh, the other thing I'd say is it, it's hard to kind of know what to make of the output because you can't sort of equate one kind of grain with the other. Like if wheat production maybe goes down, but uh, canola goes up and, and beef goes down, do you count all those tons equally. So there's a bit of an accounting issue with generating intensity based measures when you've got such diverse products as milk and flowers and wine and wheat and soybeans and pigs coming out the end of a of an agricultural system. But uh, your, your point is a good one. And I, I would concede that uh, probably the intensity measures are are improving. Okay, uh, I, I guess the uh, in the intensity question is a significant one, considering that there is now a group within Canada uh, asking for the Canadian population to reach 100 million by the end of the century. Uh, and we are bringing in immigrants for, for good reasons, mostly, uh, but at the rate of 400,000 uh, a year. Uh, so there's a lot more people. They're going to have to eat. Uh, so if, if we do it on an absolute basis, the game is over. Uh, yeah, I think though we, we have to look at what we, we do with the food. We've ramped up production. You know, we, we pushed a lot more fertilizer and, and inputs in in order to push a lot more food out. And then we waste a huge chunk of the, that food. We turn a whole bunch more into nutritionally disfigured food like colas and Cheetos and corn puffs. Uh, we turn a whole bunch more into really unwise biofuels and we're going to do more of that. We're going to try and run uh, vacation jets on biofuels that are coming off of our, our grain land, et cetera. Uh, big, you know, where I live, F-150 trucks going to places they maybe don't need to go and that, that'll be fueled with biofuels, et cetera. So I, I think once you move into that food output and feeding the world and how much food do we need and intensity, there's a whole bunch of kind of socioeconomic political questions that come into play. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Peter. And now off to Raymond Lurie. So thanks very much for the, the talk. Very, very informative. Um, and I, I like your, um, your conclusion that we need to go to, to a uh, circular system, including wind and solar, which while well, wind is really solar in another form, but uh, um, very interesting. So my, my question is uh, related to, um, you know, what are the solutions? And um, uh, I'm looking, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on uh, agrivoltaics and re regenerative agriculture and their, their role in, and, um, you know, I'm looking at regen regenerative agriculture as potentially uh, reducing the amount of uh, inputs required and uh, maybe helping to sequester more uh, carbon than what the soils currently have, right? Yeah, thanks for that, Raymond. And I think you turn, use the term agrivoltaics and I'll have to circle mm -hmm. back and get you to explain that one to me. But I'll just start by talking a little bit about regenerative agriculture. Uh, we in the National Farmers Union like to talk about agroecology. Uh, and then there's just another set of ideas around low input agriculture, but I think they're all connected. In the 20th century, 
after 10,000 years of farmers getting everything they needed from biology, they became convinced that they needed to get more and more and more from industry. And thus, you know, everything became a farm input and those farm input volumes started to increase quite dramatically. In the 21st century, we need to partly reverse that and, and get as much as we can from biology and take only what we need from industry. And that's where we get to these ideas of regenerative agriculture, agroecology, low input agriculture, et cetera. Having said that, there, there's some challenges. Defining some of these systems is difficult. Imagining them scaled up to tens of millions of acres is difficult, both on the, you know, on the market side. Some of these systems rely quite heavily on livestock. So if you imagine certain agroecological or regenerative systems scaled up to cover you know, most of the prairies, uh, the question then is, are you imagining a lot more livestock on that landscape and, and how does that affect emissions? So I, I think we need to go in that direction, but I would also suggest that the map that we need to follow in that direction isn't fully detailed yet. And there's, there's some real questions and some experimentation and some things we have to figure out. But we can certainly start moving in that direction. And the first step is to move toward lower input, try and you know, rest from each unit of fertilizer, et cetera, as much as we can in order to, to minimize that. And, and you mentioned agrivoltaics. Can you tell me what that means? Uh, it's, a, it's a combination of, of uh, solar panels and agriculture underneath, essentially. So mm. the idea there is, uh, in, in, you know, there's some areas of the world that are getting warmer and, um, and plants don't necessarily need all the, the uh, solar irradiation that they get, right? So by having solar panels covering a portion of the field, uh, you cool down the surface and uh, you, you obviously, I'm sure you know that some crops, when it's too warm, they stop growing, right? So it would, it would uh, reduce the temperature at the surface, reduce evaporation and produce electricity at the same time, right? And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm, you're, you're probably aware that Alberta and uh, Saskatchewan are, uh, ironically, <laughs> the uh, provinces that are most endowed with, the, uh, with solar and wind um, resources, right? Um, so, yeah, on, on very, very large fields in the middle of nowhere, it's a bit more difficult, but in, in uh, fields that are closer to um, places where you would consume energy, I'm thinking that might be a solution that would uh, kill two birds with one stone. That's an interesting idea. I'll look into that more. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John Meyer, you have something that you'd like to uh, pose. Yes, uh, we, in the energy field, we have this metric uh, produced originally by Charlie Hall, uh, energy returned on energy invested, and it shows the relative richness of the resource, uh, whether it's uh, oil, uh, photovoltaic, wind, hydro, whatever, uh, the amount of energy we have to use to get more energy. And I, I think, uh, and obviously this, uh, the EROIs are going down worldwide uh, on average. Uh, so I, I think that's a critical societal metric. Uh, I also think that uh, something equivalent for agriculture uh, would be equally critical to uh, help us understand what's actually happening in our uh, agricultural sector. Uh, a couple of years ago, I uh, uh, contacted Uwe Schneider and Pete Smith, who produced a study, uh, basically the amount of energy per calorie uh, uh, or calories per energy uh, input that uh, was being yielded. And, and you, you've laid out a number of issues uh, with something like that, uh, the quality of the food, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of, I think it's more complex than energy, but I think it's really critical that we uh, come up with a, a metric uh, on that uh, to, uh, to represent the overall state of uh, whether we're using more resources to get fewer amounts of food uh, or, or not. And uh, I just wonder if uh, there is anyone you know of who would be willing to work uh, on this. If, if, you, uh, uh, if you think it's worthwhile, if it's doable, do you know anyone who would be willing to work on it? Yeah, thanks for that question, John. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Charlie Hall's work on EROI and I've been to some of his get togethers. Um, 
you you may know this um the it's not right up to date but uh david and marcia pimentel and in, in food energy and society did a lot of that energy in energy out on a number of systems and you're right we it would be very useful if we did that on you know current current uh grain and oil seed and, and cattle production systems here in canada and compared them what we see from the pimentel's work and others is that our eroi is is not very good compared to sort of pre-fossil fuel systems uh what i kind of know anecdotally when people have looked at this in the prairies is that f systems that utilize fertilizer fare fare badly in those because fertilizer is the largest energy input into the system and the organic farms that don't use fertilizer score better on uh, food energy output versus external energy inputs but uh yeah i, I think a, a working group to do that and also to calculate emissions too and that gets back to that question of intensity uh, of emissions in various production systems would be very useful yeah okay thanks i, ju I just wanted to say uh that uh when i looked at this 10 years ago it appeared to be that uh, the, the intensity of energy for food was relatively stable in developed countries, uh, but uh, it required, as, as uh, more sophisticated techniques were used in the developing world, uh, their uh, output uh, per energy input was dropping. Um, and I, I think with climate change coming in now as a, as a huge unknown, uh, having a, a ratio like that that might help quantify uh, the scale, represent the scale of uh, what's what's the change that's taking place. So, thanks, Darren. Okay, so uh, Mike Nickerson is up, and then Dave Doherty will follow Mike. Okay, well, I, I have uh, two parts. Hi, Darren. Uh, two parts of uh, my question. One has to do with the linear system, and the other with the uh, the circular system. <clears throat> you said that uh, you know you implied that the all the inputs that are going into agriculture, the fertilizers and so on, end up in deep ocean burial. And I I had the impression that a bunch of it was landfilled, some of it was spread on the land. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what sort of breakdown of where this stuff actually goes if you have that information. Sure. And, and, and you're right, Mike, the, the, the N atoms that come out of the fertilizer plants that go through the system, they end up in a number of places. Um, and you're right, some of it ends up landfilled in the sewage treatment plants that do take out some of that. And, and, and largely, it's phosphorus in that case. Uh, because of heavy metal contamination and other things, it can't easily be used for fertilizer again. And some of that gets landfilled. Uh, in the plants where that, they don't strip that out, it does go down the river into the ocean. And then by a number of other means, uh, this stuff turns into, uh, into ammonia gas, into nitrous oxide, ends up somewhere else and in the atmosphere, etc. So yeah, you're, you're right in saying it's, it's a complex, interbraided, you know, multi-strand conveyor that takes the N in various directions. And the P has a little different chemistry, and so does the K. Okay. The other part was you say a uh, sustainability is circular and solar. I, I would add that it also is what we do with the life that the circular and solar 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 give us, and uh, that's that's a part of it, and that's what gives us more uh, more hope because that's what we're trying to support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Dave Doherty, and then you'll. Uh, Ted Manning, you'll follow Dave. Thanks for the talk, Darren. It's very interesting. I wonder if you could expand a little bit on how nutrient runoff has influenced the development and expansion of dead zones in oceanic estuaries. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, so as a lot of you might know, there's the big one, the one that always gets talked about at the mouth of the Mississippi. Uh, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico, huge dead zone. And uh, just a, a quick explanation, uh, nutrients, mostly nitrogen and phosphorus, go, end up swept into the river, down the river, into the ocean. They fuel a massive bloom of things like algae and plankton, which then die off and sink. And the biological oxygen demand 
from the decomposition of those deplete the, the water of, of oxygen and create these hypoxic and anoxic uh, areas of the ocean where just nothing, nothing can live. And as scientists have looked at this, they find these dead zones at the mouth of virtually every single river where there's significant agriculture in that watershed. So there's a, most of the fertilizer we put in the field, uh, I think Vaclav Smil quantifies it as 50 or 60%, misses the crop and ends up running off or leaching or volatilizing or turning into nitrous oxide or, or something, something along those lines. And a significant portion of it is, is ending up in the oceans right now. Thank you. Ted Manning, please. Hi there. I'm probably the wrong person to be coming at this time. If Anitra Thorog was here, she's one of the world's specialists in actual oceans cleanup and things. If she is here, I'd, I'd cede to her. But say one thing first that uh, we've had serious issues for years, of course, in Canada with, oh, with runoff. Uh, and some of the biggest studies were in the Great Lakes to try and really figure out how we could diminish the contamination of those lakes. And in fact, the hold up, they hold up the Lake Great Lakes Management Plan as a as a good example of trying to get an awful lot of the surface runoff at least uh, out of the lakes. Uh, there's, I think, there's an awful lot less happening internationally. And there's a, a Deck of the Oceans initiative going on right now, which some of us in the Club of Rome are involved in to try and uh, advance the understanding. So how, how can we, in fact, affect all of these farmers from, uh, there's so many of them, of course, and, we're, and we've already hit the, hit the point that, e that each non-farmer, uh, they're supporting an awful lot more non-farmers to stay eating as part of this. And yet they are the key because they are the ones managing an awful lot of the production system and, and deciding in some ways what goes off the land into the water courses. Are you aware of any really good examples of how that's being managed? I'm not Ted, um, and that's not my area of expertise, but okay. uh, I think... You know, despite our best efforts, if those curves of nitrogen fertilizer use globally and in the United States and in Canada and elsewhere, if they all keep going upward, yeah. just to some extent, the amount of nit you know, ammonia and nitrous oxide and runoff, it, it is a function of just the tonnage going on. And if the tonnage going on keeps going up, even really good public policy and environmental policy with riparian areas and, you know, placement, et cetera, eventually that gets defeated just out of the sheer magnitude of the increase of the application. So, uh, you know, the converse of that is as we take steps to reduce fertilizer use with climate change, we can also uh, reduce the runoff and the leaching and the volatilization and, and all those other problems too. So there's a lot of co-benefits to all of this. I talked a lot about climate change and, and greenhouse gases, but there's a lot of co-benefits to all of these things. Thank you, that's very nice. And I really like your definition of sustainability. Thank you. <laughs> okay, hopefully I'm back. People hearing me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, Bill Reese, you're up next. And then uh, who else? Uh, sorry about that phone call. Hi, Give I, me a chance to figure that one out. But... Sorry, Darren. Go ahead, Bill Reese. Yeah, Darren, Bill Reese, that was a terrific presentation. I've made a number of comments, but what I want to ask you is this. The linear systems that we've created have one outstanding quality. And that is that they are based on drawing down accumulated stocks of resources, including the nitrogens and phosphates and so on in natural deposits. So we get a temporary boost in production and a temporary boost in human populations, but it's based on the depletion of the essential resources, nutrients and so on required to sustain those populations. Now, my hypothesis is, and I, I'm a student of something called overshoot, uh, that if we were to return to a 
sustainable flatlining circular system, and I advocate this for cities for many years, we could not possibly support the same level of population because by definition, that has to be a regenerative system and it has to regenerate at the rate set by solar inputs, for example. So yeah, we've got this huge population now on earth, a huge industrial enterprise, but the whole thing assumes that there will be an unlimited continuing supply of raw materials to convert into more human bodies and more human capital, uh, that simply isn't on. And hence we are, or really should be planning for a contraction of the human enterprise, including the human population, back to the level whereby a linear throughput system could sustain us indefinitely. That's my hypothesis. Bill, thanks for that. I'm a huge fan of your work. So I'm very pleased to take a question from you. I think one thing is known and one thing is unknown. Um, and and I, I think that this group and others could come together to kind of answer this and flesh it out. I think what is known is moving from a linear unsustainable back to a circular sustainable system couldn't maintain this level of production. What's unknown is if it could maintain this level of population. I think that's unknown because it gets back to my previous point that you know we're, we have a level of production but we could probably cut it by two thirds and still feed everybody. I, I remember sitting with Vaclav Smil in his office and he sort of sketched out his idea where everyone on the earth eats lentils in a sort of optimized diet. And it turns out at that point that, uh, that feeding people, it, it's a much smaller enterprise. You know, as you know, we're burning it, wasting it, uh, feeding it to livestock in ways that turn, you know, Livestock on grass are very efficient, but livestock on grain can turn 10 calories into one. So it's a tremendous calorie dissipation system. So I'm not arguing against your point necessarily, but I would put it in the category of uncertain, not, uh, not certain. Okay, so let me put a caveat on it. Uh, certainly we could probably quote unquote support with food 10 billion people. But what quality of life would those 10 billion people have? And if your goal is really to support larger numbers of people, wouldn't it be better to do that over a period of time, like centuries, rather than try to do it all at once uh, at the expense of, of nature? We've already, if you've talked to Vaclav Smil, you know very well that we've displaced 98% of mammalian life from the planet, primarily to grow food, among other things. So we... You, we can't continue doing this without destroying the ecosphere. So we have no choice but to return somehow to a linear throughput system and a much scale, a smaller scale throughput. Now, I, I prefer to see that support, say, 2 billion people at a high level of standard, material standard, than 10 billion people living at the edge and not enjoying life at all. Just a personal preference. Sure, and I, I share a lot of your worries and, and, and uh, critiques of what we're doing, but uh, I, I don't necessarily think that people would have to be hungry and impoverished. We could create a, a lot more rational and efficient systems to give people the nutrition they need, good food, uh, you know, without, well, we, we could produce less food and feed people better in some cases. Okay, but the, the way the system's now going, we're seeing for the first time in decades an increase in the number of malnourished and underfed people on earth because of the maldistribution of flows and, and wealth. So we could, the question is whether we will, and that's uh -huh. the other dispute. Very good, I, I thoroughly and absolutely enjoyed what you had to say. I'm an old farm boy, by the way. I have loaded hay onto a horse-drawn wagon in the late 40s on my family farm in Ontario. So I'm a great fan of horse-drawn vehicles. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote with that for a second. I have a neighbor who farms with horses and he needs help loading hay onto wagons. And I, a, I'll be out there. <laughs> yeah, I used to go over there. And I remember just running all day to keep up with this wagon. I was younger then and I'd throw the bale and run to the next one and throw the bale. And then on the way toward the end of the day, he shows me a trick. He does a little sound with his mouth and the horse kind of goes down to half speed. And I looked at him. I said, 
you so-and-so, why didn't you show us that earlier in the day? We've been running all day to keep up with this horse and it had another gear. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, time, time for Vic Buck Buxton and then John Legge. Yes, well, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. And I asked a question, are you familiar with Musgrove Biological Corporation in Alberta? And I asked that question because they are now making claims that they manufacture and sell natural agricultural defense mechanism for treatment of diseases, pests, weeds in the agriculture set. Okay, and my apologies for the video. Okay, and the importance of that, I, my background is it, it hazardous chemicals and whatnot. And I'm just wondering that because of crop, crops are getting destroyed by diseases, pests, weeds, etc., does this cut down significantly on the, you know, the the need for reinstituting this? But so you've got all the out, the, all the inputs, but not the desired outputs. And is this contributing positively to the circular system we're looking for? And is this a major step forward? They recently said that they had developed mustard-based products that would kill the, you know, help the successful banana crop in several countries around the world. So I wonder if this is a step in the right direction. Yeah, I can't comment on the specific one there. I don't know it. What we've identified, though, is as pressure mounts to reduce input use and reduce fertilizer use, a whole range of companies are stepping forward with additives and biologicals and other things uh, that supposedly release fertility, that, that, that battle pests in a certain way. And farmers are kind of left wondering if this stuff works. And it's a bit of a buyer beware market. So I, I think with, with what you mentioned and, and all of these products, what we need in Canada and North America is some real rigorous testing to, to check on efficacy and, and long-term impacts, et cetera. Well, it's interesting because I don't know if you know Spencer Early, but he, met, he owns a fertilizer company. And he was saying, this is a step forward for the next generation <laughs> and a move in the right direction from a preservation of the planet concept, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said that it, 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 they've got, they're on the stock market. So my, my assumption is that Musgrove must have demonstrated some efficacy in cross-checking on this, or they couldn't be advertising how their success story for saving banana crops, <laughs> if they're not true. <laughs> anyway, thanks again for your presentation. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, John, your turn. Uh, thanks, Phil, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Darren. Uh, it really has filled a great uh, gap, I think, in our uh, learning in general. I have a quick question, but it's a rather broad one. How do we get back to limits to growth? The original message of the Club of Rome. I mean, all influencers seem to think that growth is good. Uh, I don't need to go into where that's going to lead us. Yeah, thanks, John. Your question, of course, can't be answered by any one person, and certainly not quickly. I think your whole sort, your whole series is is about how do we get back to the limits of, to growth and those ideas from the Club of Rome. But one thing I would say is a, a key step to, in terms of moving in that direction is to stop moving in the opposite direction, to stop moving away from limits to growth. And another way to tell the story of agricultural emissions that I told you today is to start at the top, to start at the the core policy of the Canadian government. And if, if Canadian agriculture has a prime directive, it is this, increase exports. And we've seen over the last 25 years, the government, federal government in partnership with industry would bring forward a new target. They're going to double agri-food exports from 10 to 20 billion. And then they reach that and they're going to double them from 20 to 40. And we've got another one now, I think it's heading for 75. So if your prime directive, if the most important gauge on the dashboard of government is export volumes and export dollars, 
and, and you're seeking to maximizing, maximize exports, you're also going to maximize, try and maximize production and yield. And as you do that, you're going to have to maximize inputs. And as you do that, you're going to maximize emissions. So by that chain of causation, endlessly trying to double and redouble exports has the unintended consequence of pushing the system into higher emission territory. So, you know, limits to growth are one thing, but if a government has as its prime directive that things are going to double and redouble and redouble, uh, at the very least, they need to stop that and see what, see what the system does, whether it sort of moves toward a limit or whether it continues to expand. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so Peter McKinnon, you are scheduled for a uh, comment or a question. And I think we're sort of running out of time, but I do have Miranda and Jim Dyer on deck if we can squeeze you in. So Peter, go ahead. Thank you, Phil. And uh, Darren, uh, I thought that was a superb presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is uh, within the context of cities, and I actually was in your seat about three weeks ago, giving a presentation to this group on smart cities. And this is a follow-up question to that discussion in the Q&A after my presentation. So uh, within the context of cities, is there a there's been considerable discussion about operating as a circular economy. And this includes growing local food on rooftops and walls and so on in cities. These are these concepts that are being put forward. And moreover, cities are also a major source of greenhouse gases, as I'm sure you know. Uh, at least 65% of all greenhouse gases are emitted through the operations of cities. So I'm just wondering, um, what do you see as a future for food production within cities as part of the circular economy? And uh, as, all, as well in, in the impact on greenhouse gas production and consumption. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that question, Peter. Um, I think all of that's important. I'm, I'm a little less optimistic about rooftops, et cetera, but let me just say one thing we could do around cities that is just tremendously positive and, and promising and just common sense. And that is cities should be buying up all the land in a donut around them, you know, maybe uh, 40 kilometers out or something. Like imagine if a city, you were in Saskatoon recently, that's where I live. Imagine if Saskatoon just bought up all the land in a 40 kilometer radius uh, that was offered up for sale and then turned that land over in long-term leases to young farmers, new Canadians, people who are willing to farm it organically or regeneratively or agroecologically, um, people who wanted to do things different. We could create around that city uh, a whole diverse patchwork of, of actual food production. And the city might then purchase some uh, electric trucks that are charged from photovoltaics and those trucks could go out on a regular basis and pick up that food from those farms and bring it back into neighborhood food hubs where people could access on bikes and by walking and, and etc by, by transit yes. and boy oh boy if you wouldn't all of a sudden start to have and some of those tr farms might even use uh, say small battery electric tractors to do their work and you might start to have some zero emission food. I realize there's some materials that have to be produced, but as much as possible, you would start to have some zero emission food feeding into that city. And we detail that idea in, a, in our Imagine If report, and we, we talk about food sheds. And when people hear about this, they kind of perk up, like this is a new idea. But what we also remind people of is, cities have been around for about 5,000 years. And for 4,900 years, they were fed by the food shed surrounding them because it was simply impossible to feed them any other way you couldn't do overland transport you couldn't move mushrooms from china to saskatoon in any way so cities have been fed by their food sheds for 99 percent of the time we had cities and it's time we got back to that and it's time that we intentionally put that system together in a way that some of that food was was near zero emission the the the, the toing and froing and the far-flungedness of our urban nutrition systems just it cannot be sustained through the 21st century well i agree with you and thank you for that comment and i might just say i'm in ottawa area and uh, ottawa itself has over 1200 active farms within the city limits most of them are dairy and cash crop farms thank you for your comment 
Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, Miranda, are you still with us? You. Yes, I am. The Hi. Air. Hi. Uh, first off, thanks so much for an awesome talk. Um, I guess I'm a bit of an outlier in terms of the audience here, um, but I currently, you know, a lot of the work that I currently do in terms of volunteering is around like regenerative agriculture and stuff. And one of the big questions that has come to my mind um, is that, you know, what 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 steps do you foresee in terms of scale, and what partnerships do you hope to form that will help you? scale this idea of a circular farming economy in a scalable way because as I've been researching myself you know there's a lot of groups out there under different banners of regenerative agriculture agroecology so what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is what kind of partnerships do you hope to form moving forward how do you plan to scale up and then finally you know at a consumer level as someone who's just more so on the outside looking in how can the average person support that scaling and how can they support the transition towards that renewable circular farming economy? Thanks, Miranda. Your question is probably the most challenging one I've been asked today. And that is, you know, in a system that's increasingly dominated by these corporate retailers and processors, and when processing is increasingly far flung, you probably know that, you know, just about all the beef in Canada goes through a couple of plants and where the system is sort of driving farmers to produce a smaller and smaller number of, of cash crops, you know, corn and soybeans in Ontario and wheat and canola in the West. How do you scale this up? And uh, I, I wish I had some simple answers to that. I think right now the dominant forces in the system are actually pushing us in the other direction. And uh, you know, it, it is a difficult one. The, the National Farmers Union is working very, very hard to create a, a regulatory system that, that provides local abattoirs for livestock producers to get their, their animals, uh, you know, processed to, and to the consumer. We're part of 20 organizations that have come together in Farmers for Climate Solutions to try and move the government to a set of rational policies that uh, don't just drive us toward ever larger farms and more specialization and more concentration, et cetera. But I don't have a, a, a simple and easy answer to how you take a system that's organized in the way it is right now and, and redirect it. But I am more optimistic than I was even a year or two ago. I'm seeing a real change in the federal government around sustainability and climate and an emission reduction. So. Uh, I think there's an opening there, but there's a long, long way to go before we can move from this 20th century linearized, high input corporate dominated system toward the, the kinds of systems we want and need. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, thanks Darren. Uh, Jim Dyer, we're going to uh, have time for you. And then I think we're gonna have time to work in John McClintock as well. So over to you, Jim Dyer. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't have much, much to say other than, other than the text message I share, but that uh, um, a lot of the, um, the pathway towards getting to what Darren is talking about, the sustainability is to simply look at how we produce protein. Um, animal protein, the, uh, 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 carbon footprint of animal proteins compared to say uh, legume proteins is is like uh, orders of magnitude higher. Um, now I'm not saying that everybody should equal eat, eat uh, beans and lentils and such, but uh, even if even if if we reduce animal protein and also if we went from uh, uh, ruminant livestock uh, protein to non-ruminant livestock. Uh, and you don't have to even go all the way, but if you went, if you went a, a large portion more um, of your animal protein from pork and poultry as compared to uh, uh, um, cattle, that would, that would substantially reduce our uh, resource consumption and certainly our carbon footprint as well. And we've done some work. Uh, I've been working with Ray over the past uh, couple of decades and in the last decade or so has largely been on, um, on looking at the carbon footprint of, of livestock and uh, that's that's kind of what we found. Uh, that works published if you're interested. Okay. 
Thanks, Jim, and, and thanks for all your work in this space. Um, that graph I showed at the beginning includes some of Jim's data on uh, things like electricity and machinery, uh, emissions from the production of machinery, and I've learned a ton about uh, energy use and emissions in agriculture from Jim's work. Um, yeah, I, I guess you, you put it as well as I could, Jim. Um, you know, we need to look at the, the system and what it's converting and, and you know, how we could eat uh, with the, the least impact. And so there's some consumer demand and consumer choice issues here for sure. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of it's with, with the consumer choices. Very good talk, uh, Darren. Thank you, Jim. Okay, so John, we do have a few minutes uh, available for you to talk to Darren. Right, well, um, Darren, thank you very, very much indeed for an absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. A lot of deep thinking has gone into it and you uh, revealed a lot of interesting facts and figures. So thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm, uh, I found it extremely interesting because I am by profession an, an agricultural economist and I've been working in, in Europe uh, on European agriculture. Now what I found, I was curious about one of your graphs. The graphs which show the number of tractors in Canada going up and um, a commensurate decline in the number of horses. Okay. Now that, that uh, graph, if I, if I interpret it, interpreted it correctly, does it show that there are still a large number of horses on farms in Canada? Because it seemed to me that there were about three, hundred thousand horses still on farms in Canada and if that's correct I find that extremely curious because I would have thought most farms most farmers in Canada have switched over to, to tractors hi uh, yeah thanks for that John um, I think that graph cuts off in 1980 so things might have happened um, things might have changed a little bit in subsequent years but if you're interested uh, I don't have the references in top of mind, but that graph in my book, in the footnote, there's a reference to the same graph for the United States and one for the UK. So these are graphs that have been done for several countries. They're fascinating. And the other yes. thing I would say about that graph is that it shows the number of tractors and the number of horses, and it, it kind of looks like the, you know, the, the two cross in the middle, but because the tractors have so many more horsepower than a horse, the pulling power of the tractors, the total pulling power of the tractors eclipsed the pulling power of the horses in the 1920s, not the 1940s. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, um, can I ask another question about uh, tractors? Um, on your farm, uh, your farm in Saskatchewan, uh, you presumably have one or several tractors. Yeah, I, I don't farm myself anymore, but uh, I'm surrounded by far okay. people who do farm our land. So I, I might be able to answer your question. So, okay, let's take a farmer uh, close to you to where you're living. And he's got a one tractor or two tractors, maybe three tractors. Now, I fully um, endorse this idea of a more circular uh, uh, agricultural economy and uh, a very important source of carbon emissions uh of greenhouse ca greenhouse gas emissions from farming is the use of fossil fuels in tractors is it not mm -hmm. now the question is how could that be reduced because i can't see i might well be wrong but i can't see how farmers in saskatchewan or even farmers over here in europe i can't see how they are still going to be able to farm and yet use less fossil fuels for their tractors. I can't see how they're going to be able to cut it, say, by, by 50%, which is uh, really what has to happen if, if uh, countries are going to meet their, uh, their climate goals under the Paris Agreement. There's got to be a substantial cut in greenhouse gas emissions from farming. Now, I, you explained, and I agree, that... Uh, um, better use of fertilizer could make a, a, a contribution, but the use of fossil fuels of diesel on farms for tractors is 
a conundrum which I don't see an easy solution to that. Uh, thanks for that, John. And I think the answer isn't written yet. In our reports over the last three years, we've speculated about uh, small and medium sized battery electric tractors, maybe not big ones, but the small and medium sized, you know, I, I point out that you could take the parts off a Tesla shelf and, uh, you know, a couple engines and three battery packs and you'd have a pretty good medium sized tractor. Um, but that's a bit speculative. Yeah, okay. uh, and the same thing about hydrogen, it's not clear if anyone's going that direction or not. But what I would say is just watch the long haul trucking space because the, the powertrains used in tractors and the powertrains used in long haul trucking companies like Cat and Cummins and others, uh, if, if the long haul trucking sector can come up with zero emission vehicles, then that'll just be transplanted into agriculture. Agriculture isn't going to figure this out for itself. It's a, it's a consumer of, of engines that come from other places. So uh, if, if, they get, if they can make trucks that work, they can probably make tractors that work. And then we can go to zero emission tractors and uh, you know, put up solar panels on our farms. And that's what I meant by the fact that those solar panels hint at the possibility of some very low input, low emission, more circular systems. Okay. Well, that's all very, very interesting. And um, certainly your point about Canadian agriculture uh, having the ambition to export more, this is highly questionable. And uh, in my view, Canadian agriculture should perhaps export less. And that's the same applies to the European Union. The European Union believes that uh, when its farmers export more, then this shows that the farming is successful. But that's a very, very narrow um, appreciation of the word success, because what happens is that these exports from the European Union, they're subsidized. And so they knock farmers elsewhere in the world uh, off, um, off their farms. They cause unemployment. They cause um, farming to decline in other countries of the world because our exports from the European Union are subsidized. And so they undercut farmers in Africa and in the Middle East. And I'm not sure if uh, that same system of subsidization might happen in Canada as well. Are, are your farmers subsidized by, um, by, the, by the Canadian government? Uh, not well, to I'm going to have to intervene you, here. You've, yep. yeah, you've, yeah. So, John, you have asked a really interesting question, and it could be the topic of a whole presentation and <laughs> followed by other presentations. Um, we are running out of time. I okay. have to thank you, Darren, for a really wonderful presentation. There are other people, as you can see in the chat box, that would like to ask questions. We will continue after we terminate the recording and some of us hopefully you Darren will be able to hang around to continue with more personal chats and so in order to wrap up uh, Jean Doherty has a formal thank you at which point the recording will stop. Um, Darren I would really like to thank you on behalf of the Canadian Association of for the Club of Rome for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, as pointed out to a, by a, quite a few of the people, you have filled a gap in some of the knowledge and understanding that we have for, um, for things that um, looking at greenhouse gas and climate change issues. So this has been really, really informative, especially for us. So thank you very much for this great presentation that you've given today. Um, for those of you who are still with us, um, I would encourage you very much to look at our website, um, CanadianCore.com, and um, you can go in there and in the Stay Informed section, if you wish to apply for that, you will be given the notification of this presentation that uh, Darren has given, and it will be on posted on our website and posted on our YouTube channel so that you can look at it at any time in the, in the future. Also on our YouTube channel, you will see all the other presentations that have been made to the Club of Rome or to the uh, KCOR. And I really strongly encourage you to look at that and to subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel so that you can get this information. Likewise, if you're at all interested in joining um, KCOR as a, a member, the information is also on our website. So again, Darren, 
On behalf of KCOR, I would really like to thank you very much for a wonderful presentation today. Thank you.